JavaScript and Friends Conference 2020. Uh, thanks a lot for tuning in. My name is Arun, and today I will be talking about the Web Gamepad API and how it can be used to create some really exciting experiences on the web. First, a bit about myself. Um, I'm a software engineer by profession, and I mostly work with uh, web technologies, building enterprise web software and browser-based tools. Recently started working on game programming tools and services. Uh, I'm a tech speaker and a community meetup organizer for ReactJS in New Delhi. I'm also an open source enthusiast. Uh, I've contributed to several open source projects and released some of my own projects, uh, mostly extension libraries and modules for Node, React, Angular, etc. Feel free to check out my open source work on GitHub if you'd like at github.com slash Souza. Now, uh, let's get straight into it. Let's talk about the web platform itself for a bit uh, before jumping into the GamePad API. Now, the web has certainly grown a lot over the last uh, half a decade and continues to grow at an enormous pace. And uh, the, the highlight of this explosive growth is the continuous addition of uh, feature-rich APIs that enables developers to create a much more interactive and efficient web applications. The browser has become more than just a renderer or a document viewer, and we all know that. Developers have been constantly pushing uh, the boundaries of the web, which has led to its common adoption as a software platform. Enhancements such as uh, GPU accelerated graphics, uh, file system access, ambient light events, and lower level APIs that provide native control and hardware access uh, not only allow developers to cater to a wider spectrum of users, but it also allows them to support uh, various other platforms and use cases. Even though these APIs are in very early stages at the moment, uh, they seem to be really, really promising and tend to provide an idea on how web development in uh, the coming years might look like. Browsers have become extremely powerful and capable enough to handle complex graphics computations, especially for playing video games. From 2D side scrollers, uh, retro classics, to even high end 3D games, it's possible to play almost any type of game on the web today. And for a majority of these games uh, that we see and play on the web, the primary form of input has always been uh, keyboard or mouse based. And for touch screen uh, devices, we have seen on screen control, uh, control layouts like these, which at times um, can hinder the gameplay experience. But for the most part, these kinds of setups are very well suit a wide variety of games. But using these types of controls can turn out uh, to be quite a daunting task for gamers who prefer more natural controls, you know, uh, like a directional pad or maybe a joystick for character movements. Now, desktop games provide this flexibility of using uh, external devices like gamepads and joysticks to gamers, majorly because they have uh, native support for this built right in. But when it comes to the web, for a long time, there has been no native support for this at all developers had to design these complex uh, mouse or keyboard based interfaces for game controls that can be tricky to operate and can take some time to get used to. Turns out a few years back, the W3C introduced the gamepad specification, which defines a low level interface to represent uh, gamepad devices. Now, what does that mean? It means that using this API, developers would be able to connect uh, gamepads and similar input devices to the browser and uh, be able to use them in their gaming applications. It sounds really cool. Now, before we go any further, please do note that as of now, the gamepad specification is a work in progress and was published by the Web Applications Working Group as a working draft. The specification itself is intended uh, to become a W3C recommendation. For now, uh, we can see that the API itself 
is supported by all modern browsers, uh, which is a good sign. So let's take a look at the API itself and how we can use it today in our gaming applications. So there's a method available on the navigator interface, uh, which returns a list of gamepad objects, one for each connected uh, gamepad to the browser. And every connected uh, gamepad is an instance of the gamepad interface. Now this gamepad interface returns useful information about the connected gamepad. Uh, information related to the buttons, the access, uh, the current states, and other information like the device ID, status, etc. If you look closely at the, the gamepad buttons, we can see that every button is an instance of the gamepad button interface. Now this interface represents an individual button of the gamepad and uh, allows access to the current state of the button. Using this, we can determine whether the button uh, was pressed or not and carry out the appropriate action in the game. You know, uh, whether it's pausing the game or making the character jump, firing a bullet or whatever. Now, every gamepad manufacturer uh, creates many different uh, types of products and each might have a unique style uh, or, or a unique layout of buttons and access. It is the job of the user agent, of course, to support as many of these as possible, which is why the Gamepad API recommends a de facto standard layout uh, that has been made popular by many gaming consoles. And this layout of buttons and access is known as the standard Gamepad layout. And in this layout, button locations are placed out in a left cluster of four buttons, a right cluster of four buttons, a center cluster of three buttons, uh, some controllers might have four, and a pair of front facing buttons or shoulder buttons as they are called on the left and right side of the gamepad. Please do note that since the gamepad API is in very early stages, uh, the standard gamepad button layout may differ from browser to browser. Uh, the following image describes the default button map mix as on Google Chrome. So how exactly can we track these button state changes? Are there any um, events exposed by the Gamepad API that we can use? Let's find out. The Gamepad API provides the Gamepad connected event, which is emitted whenever a new Gamepad is connected to the browser. If the Gamepad is already connected, when the page loads and gains focus, then the event is emitted when a button is pressed or an axis is moved on the Gamepad. Similarly, there's the gamepad disconnected event, which is emitted whenever a gamepad is disconnected from the browser. Sadly, there is no standardized way uh, to detect gamepad button presses or access movements. As we've seen already, the gamepad interface does return useful information about uh, the gamepad buttons, the access and the current states. But, it's, but there is no actual event uh, that is dispatched when these actions are performed by the user. Currently, the Gamepad API only supports uh, the Gamepad connected and disconnected events. So let's try to explore what we can do to track the Gamepad button presses and access movements. We might have a gamepad connected to the browser, uh, and in order to track the button access states, we can continuously poll for the changes in a set interval call. That is pretty much the simplest thing that we can start off with. If we look at the code here, uh, we can see that we are logging out the information of the first button of the first gamepad uh, that is connected to the browser. Uh, that's why we use the zeroth index. Now this works fine. We are able to catch the button state as it updates, uh, but is this the best way to do it? Let's try to answer that. We all know that in JavaScript, everything runs on a single thread um, and the time of functions are no exception. To execute code using set interval, uh, we specify a callback that is executed every X milliseconds. 
the delays provided to these timer functions are uh, sometimes not honored due to priority execution of resource intensive tasks, uh, if any in the task queue. And this leads to inconsistent uh, delay intervals. You might have noticed a jank uh, while using set interval to animate uh, elements on the page. This is caused due to uh, unnecessary and forceful reflows of the page elements even before the user screen is ready to process and render those updates. This is called layout thrashing and should be avoided at all costs. So if set interval is not the optimum way to poll for gamepad button and access changes, then what else can we do? Request animation frame to the rescue. Now the callback provided to request animation frame is guaranteed to be executed at the start of the frame, which means uh, that the specified callback will be called before the next repaint operation happens. The number of times the callback function is requested uh, is around 60 times a second or 60 FPS, but will match the screen's uh, refresh rate. That is why for uh, most operations or animations that are required to remain in sync with the rendering, it is recommended to use a request animation frame for best performance. Now coming back uh, to the GameBad API, we can see that querying the GameBad objects and uh, accessing the button or access states can be done effectively using a request animation frame. In the context of a video game, a game loop is something that continuously checks for user input, uh, updates the game state, and renders the scene. Now, request animation frame seems to be fitting well for this, as we can perform all these operations uh, in its callback, and it would remain in sync with the repaint tasks in every frame. Ideally, that's how a uh, user input should be polled in a gaming application. I'd highly recommend checking, uh, checking this article at uh, developer.mozilla.org if you want to know more about how a typical game loop workflow can be implemented in JavaScript. So just to recap, uh, you're able to detect whenever a gamepad is connected or disconnected from the browser. Uh, that is something that the GamePad API supports already. We are able to access the button or access state changes using request animation frame, which is great. Now, what we ideally would want to do is to provide this functionality in the form of an API uh, that can be ex exposed and reused in any gaming application. So let's see how uh, we can extend the GamePad API to achieve this. Uh, so I'll open up my code editor here and I'll start uh, with the request animation frame loop implementation. Right, so let's create a new file here uh, called loop.js uh, which will contain our request animation frame loop. And let's zoom in a bit. Uh, let's create a variable called loop. And let's export this out. Now within the loop, let's have a start method. Now within the start method, well, so of course start our request animation frame loop. And uh, within the loop, we'll make sure that we're listening to uh, the button events as well as the access movements for uh, all the game paths connected to the browser. First, of course, we need to fetch all the game paths uh, which are connected to the browser. So we'll use the navigator.getGamePaths call. So let's do that. Let's create a variable called GamePaths. And we'll use the navigator.getGamePaths call. Now, since we need to loop through these game paths, uh, we need to make sure that this is an array. Uh, but uh, the thing is that the return value of the navigator.getGamePaths call is does not return an array, so we need to convert it. And uh, to convert it, we'll use the array.prototype.slice call. So simply we can 
reassign the value of the game paths uh, variable to this. Now uh, we have the game paths as an array. Now for the game, each game pad, what we'll do is firstly we'll check whether it's a valid gamepad connected to the browser. If it's true, then of course we need to listen to the button events as well as the access movements. Great. And of course, uh, uh, to both of these event handlers, we need to pass in the gamepad information. Next step would be to start the request animation frame loop. So we'll simply call it and we'll pass in the start method. Great, so uh, on each frame we are calling this dot start, which will basically loop through the game pads, all the game pads connected to the browser, and for each game pad. Uh, we are listening to the button events as well as the access movements. Great. Now, uh, one thing to note is uh, the return value of the request animation frame method. So uh, it basically returns uh, a long integer value, which is the request ID uh, that uniquely identifies the callback function. So we can use this ID to cancel the frame callback requests. Uh, of course, we need to do this because we need to make sure that we stop the loop uh, and cancel all the callback requests and free the memory when it's no longer required. Uh, one use case can be to use this uh, when all the game paths have been disconnected uh, from the browser and there is no need for polling of button and access state changes. So let's assign this, the return value of request animation frame to a variable called ID. And let's create it here. And let's create a stop function, which would basically stop our request animation frame loop. And to stop the request animation frame loop, we need to use the cancel animation frame method. And to this method, we need to pass in the ID, which would be the ID of the uh, request animation frame callback, which we can pass to the stop method. Great. Now let's uh, jump into the button events handler uh, implementation. So let's create one more file over here called events. Dot JS. And let's create our buttons, uh, button events uh, handler. We know that we are passing the gamepad object to it. Now, uh, what we need to do is we need to loop through the gamepad buttons. So, gamepad.buttons dot for each. And for each button, uh, we need to check whether the button has been pressed or not. And if it's pressed, we, we need to dispatch an event. So uh, the gamepad button interface provides uh, a key called pressed, which we can check. And it basically uh, can, uh, will tell us whether the button has been pressed or not. If it has been pressed, we would dispatch an event. Uh, let's call this the button pressed event. And we'll pass in the event data, which in this case would be the button information itself. If it's not pressed, we can simply handle uh, the button please. Right. Let's uh, see what the event itself would look like. 
Now uh, the event receives uh, the event data, which is the information button. And we'll use uh, the custom events API to create a custom event for tracking the button presses. So let's call this event uh, gamepad button pressed. And the associated information that we want to pass to the event would be the event data. Which is of course the information of the button itself being passed to the event. One tip is to maintain uh, an internal, internal key value mapping of all the button states uh, and discard these values as and when the state changes. Uh, this way we will be able to dispatch the custom events only uh, when the state is positive. Great, so uh, let's move to the access moments event handler. So let's create uh, the variable here and we know that we're passing in the gamepad. Firstly, we'll extract the access from the gamepad. And let's create a variable called total access uh, indexes, which should be the length of the access. And let's create a variable called total sticks or the joysticks on the gamepad. So if we divide this by Two, that should return us the total number of sticks. Again, considering that there are two sticks on left and side, left and right side of the gamepad, as per the standard gamepad layout. Great. Now, if we loop through the axis For each axis, uh, we need to determine the direction of the movement and the stick that was moved. So let's create a variable called stick moved here and another variable called direction of movement. Now, of course, referring to the standard gamepad layout again, uh, if the axis is less than the total number of sticks, then it would be the left stick. Otherwise, it would be the right stick. Now, we know that because uh, if we look at the diagram here, we can see that axis 0 uh, is the horizontal axis on the left stick and axis 1 uh, is the vertical axis on the left stick. Similarly, we have axis 2 as the horizontal axis on the right stick and axis 3 as the vertical axis on the right stick. So if, of course, uh, the index, which would be the index of, this, uh, of the axis, is less than the total number of sticks, uh, which is 2 in this case, then uh, the stick that is being used is the left stick. So we can simply check for the index. If it's less than the total number of sticks, then the stick which was moved is of course the left stick. We can of course pass this information to the custom event that we would be creating. Uh, of course, otherwise, uh, if it's greater than the total number of sticks or equal to it, then the stick moved is of course the right stick. Great. Now, in order to determine the direction of the movement, uh, we need to take a closer look at uh, the axes themselves and how the values are associated uh, with the axis. Now, on the left axis, uh, left or left stick, if we see uh, axis zero, of course, is the horizontal axis, and the left side of this axis basically represents all the negative values 
So whenever a user moves uh, the stick to the left, whatever value we would be getting would be a negative value. Similarly, if the user would be moving the stick to the right direction uh, on the zero axis, we would be getting a positive value. Similarly, we have the right stick where uh, movement of the in the left direction would give us a negative value and a movement on the right direction would give us a positive value. So if we check for the indexes, we can simply check whether the index is zero or if the index is two. Uh, again, if it's the horizontal axis on the left stick, which is axis zero, or the horizontal axis on the right stick, which is axis two, then it means it's a movement in either the left or right directions. And uh, we'll simply check for the axis value, which is the value of the axis movement, uh, which can be negative, positive, or zero. So if it's less than zero, uh, like I mentioned, if, if it's less, less than zero, which means it's negative, it's a movement in the left side. If it's positive, it's a movement on the right side. So if it's uh, less than zero, again, it means that the user is moving the stick in the left direction. Otherwise, it's the right direction. And we can simply assign uh, this to the direction of movement uh, variable. Similarly, we can uh, do the same thing for the right stick. We can check for the index whether it's uh, 1 or uh, if the index is 3. Again, referring to the diagram, if uh, axis 2 being the horizontal axis on the right stick and axis 3 being the vertical axis on the right stick but here we'll only looking at the vertical axis 1 and 3 so axis 1 would be the vertical axis on the left stick and axis 3 would be the vertical axis on the right stick so if it's axis 1 or 3 then it means uh, it's a movement in either the top or bottom directions that's why we're checking for uh, indexes 1 and 3. Again, we can check whether the axis value or the, uh, the movement of the axis, uh, if it's less than 0, then it means that it's a movement in the top direction. A negative value represents a movement in the top direction, and a positive value represents uh, a movement in the bottom direction. And again, we can assign this to the variable direction of movement. Now, we have been able to determine uh, the direction of the movement as well as uh, the stick uh, which was moved on the gamepad. And we can simply assign this data to a variable called event data. And let's assign the values. And uh, again, we'll use the dispatch event call to dispatch our uh, event. Let's call this event access movement event. And we'll pass in the event data. Now, uh, the event itself is again going to be a custom uh, event quite similar to uh, the one here that we have created for uh, tracking gamepad button events now we will use the custom events ABI and let's specify our custom event and then uh, let's call this gamepad uh, access mode and the data associated with the event would be the event data, which in this case is uh, 
the data uh, associated with the stick, uh, which is the direction and the stick uh, which was moved, whether it was the left or right stick. So we're passing this data to, to the uh, custom event. Great, so we have our uh, event listers created and we can simply export these out. And we can simply use them in our loop. Now, listening to the gamepad button pressed event on the window object to return the info of the pressed button. And the gamepad axis moved event uh, would return the info of the axis that was moved. That's pretty much it. We've been able to extend the gamepad API, uh, the gamepad interface in particular, to track button presses and axis movements. Now the thing is that you don't have to do this entire implementation all by yourself because there's an existing open source library that you can simply use in your projects. I'd like to introduce Joypad.js, a JavaScript library that lets you connect and use various gaming controllers with browsers that support the Gamepad API. It's 5 KB in size with zero dependencies and has support for button press, access movement events, and much more. All the code snippets uh, that I showed you have been taken from the source code of, of the library itself. You can check it out uh, at bit.ly slash joypad underscore JS. It's a utility library that I open sourced uh, some time back uh, under the MIT license. Uh, it exposes an event-based API uh, that can be used to subscribe to certain events that are detected and dispatched internally by the library. Subscribing to events is as simple as uh, specifying an event name and a callback that is fired whenever the specified event is triggered. It supports events for handling gamepad connection, disconnection, uh, it also supports uh, events for button presses and access movements. It's extremely lightweight and uh, simple to use. Uh, just use the joypad.on method to subscribe to an event and you're good to go. It also exposes the vibrate method uh, that can be used to play the vibration effect which is supported by some of the browsers. As, as far as I know, only Google Chrome supports it at the moment. So basically it can be used to make a gamepad vibrate and uh, you can set the delay, the duration and all uh, to customize the effect of the vibration. The library also provides the set method that can be used to configure global settings for the vibration uh, play effect uh, axis movement threshold, which basically sets the rigidness of the movement, uh, and the custom button mapping option, which can be used uh, to set custom button mappings for improved cross-browser button state tracking. Like I mentioned earlier, different browsers might implement their own standard button mapping for gamepads. But using this option, um, we can make sure that the mappings are accurate and all the buttons work as expected on all browsers which can be really useful when you are targeting uh, users on multiple devices and browsers. The browser support is pretty good. Uh, Joypad.js works on all modern browsers uh, that have support for the Gamepad API, of course. Developers have been using the library in all uh, different sorts of projects, you know, uh, games, interactive applications, IoT, which is fantastic. So please uh, feel free to give it a try and share your thoughts or suggestions that you might have. I would like to point out again that the Gamepad API is in very early stages, uh, so it may undergo major implementation changes. I'll try my best to keep the library up to date with the specification, uh, 
nonetheless, uh, pull requests are more than welcome for bug fixes and new features. Again, you, uh, you can check it out at bit.ly slash joypad underscore js. As you might have already guessed, uh, I have been doing a lot of research on the topic and have published some blogs that might be really helpful. Uh, you can check them out here. Uh, that is it from my end. Uh, if you have any questions, suggestions, or if you'd like to say hi, feel free to reach out to me on Twitter at uh, amdisusa92. Uh, thank you so much again for joining in and listening to me. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. Uh, take care, everyone, and stay safe.